all who surrender will be spared. Whoever does not surrender but opposes with struggle and dissension shall be annihilated. Genghis Khan. Welcome to EOS Weekly. This video is made possible in part by EOS New York, a top 21 block producer who is dedicated to reinvesting into the success of EOS and always adding value. Please help show your support for these videos by voting for EOS New York. In Block Explorers, you can see a flag representing where each BP is located. This is a bit of an oversimplification as block producers have redundancy in their nodes. Each BP has multiple instances running in separate locations around the world, so that if one location were to go down for some reason, the second or third location can pick up the slack without that BP missing a beat. You can check the node locations of any BP by going to their website and looking at their bp.json file. It should be located at the main website URL with a forward slash bp.json. If you dig into these bp.json files, You'll see that sometimes the secondary nodes are in the same country or a nearby country as the primary node. Other times they are in a completely different region of the world. But in general, looking at the flags in a block explorer will give you a pretty good indication as to how geographically diversified the EOS blockchain is at a given time. The concern that is spurring a number of debates among the EOS community is that the top 21 spots are becoming dominated by Asian-based BPs. China in particular has nine spots in the top 21 at the time of this recording. And there are three active BPs in Singapore and three in Japan. It's nothing against any of these countries or the region as a whole. It's just that we, the EOS community, are constantly on the lookout for any signs of centralization, for single points of failure. And when too many of our active nodes are clustered in any one country or one region, it does present a vulnerability. So the conversation in the EOS Telegram chats has turned towards different ways to improve our BP election process. Because clearly based on this regional concentration, there is some room for improvement. There are a lot of ideas on the table in terms of how to enhance our BP election mechanics, such as increasing voter participation through incentives. Voter participation is currently at about 30%. Or by changing the vote multiplier. Or we could adjust the staking period or various combinations of these things. We'll get into all of these variables and some of the specific ideas being suggested in the weeks ahead. But in this episode, we wanted to start with the problem itself. So what we're going to do now is analyze the voting patterns of the biggest whale voters so that we can understand the situation at a deeper level. This chart here on EOS Authority's site is a powerful tool when analyzing this type of thing. This shows which accounts are voting for which block producers. It's ordered with the biggest voters for each BP on the left, with the smaller votes to the right. And you can mouse over each of these bars here and see the names of the accounts that are voting for each particular BP. Using this data, if we zoom in on the whales, and just look at the whales that are voting with 3 million EOS or more, using that threshold of 3 million EOS, what we find is that there are 14 whales in this 3 million plus EOS club. Only 14 entities voting with 3 million or more EOS. And looking at how these 14 whales vote, some interesting patterns start to emerge. Obviously, the 14 biggest whale voters are going to have a big impact on the BP rankings. This is no surprise. But exactly how much influence does this relatively small set of 14 whales exert over our BP selection process? In the remainder of this episode, we're going to go through some noteworthy observations that might shed some light on the level of influence these 14 whales have over the BP rankings. And this will also help us to understand the current situation as to why EOS has drifted to be a bit more Asia-centric. So, the visual that you are seeing here shows how the 14 whales are voting for the top 21 BPs. This is based on a snapshot of data taken on May 21st. The first thing to note here is that a BP candidate needs at least four of these 14 whales to vote for them in order to get a spot in the top 21. This isn't to say that it would be mathematically impossible to get into the top 21 without four of these whales behind them. It's just that as of today, nobody in the top 21 has less than four of these whales voting for them. Here is the distribution. There are five BPs in the top 21 with four of these whales voting for them. There are also five BPs in the top 21 with five whales voting for them. There are four BPs with six whales behind them four BPs with seven whales behind them, two BPs with eight whales, 
and a single BP with nine of these whales backing them. Bitfinex and Huobi are the two mega whales amongst our 14 biggest voters here. And these two mega whales are so big that they dwarf the next tier down. These exchanges have around the same amount at 39 and 38 million EOS to vote with each, which they spread out amongst a large set of proxy accounts so that they have fine-grained control over how their votes are distributed. So here's another interesting observation. This one specifically about our two mega whales. Every block producer in the top 40 has the vote of at least one of our two mega whales. To put this bluntly, this means that our top two voting whales are causing such an impact that they are determining who is and who is not in the top 40 spots. Again, this is not to say that it would be impossible to get into the top 40 without the support of at least one of these two exchanges. It would certainly be mathematically possible to do so. It's just that as of right now, nobody is in the top 40 without the backing of at least one of these two mega whales. Now, to be fair, Bitfinex does enable its users to vote however they want with their tokens, so some of this is controlled at the end user level. But still, this alone is a point of centralization for EOS at the moment, with only two entities exerting so much influence. And this also feeds into the geographical centralization that we've been seeing, which we'll get into more in a moment. There are other exchanges that are on the sidelines that are not voting right now at all. Binance, Bithum, OKEX. These are all mega whale exchanges holding anywhere from 20 to 50 million EOS. Adjusting the EOS voting mechanics, such as adding a voter incentive, would not only increase the voter turnout among the common everyday token holder, but it could also potentially lure in some of these currently non-voting exchanges. Theoretically, the more voters, the better, even if this means bringing in a third or fourth exchange into the voting mix. Four is definitely more decentralized than two. Bitfinex and Huobi also run block producer nodes, and the two of them do vote for one another, which tends to keep both of them ranked in the top 10 spots. Neither of them vote for one another with 100% of their voting power, though. You can see what their full voting power is when you look at how much they vote for themselves. And you'll notice that the amount they vote for each other drops down for both, to 60 or 70% of their full voting power. Now, going back to our 14 whales here, the reason why we have these color-coded into two different sets is because the seven red whales here on the right tend to vote heavily for Asian-based BPs, Huobi being one of those seven whales. The Asian-based block producers are also color-coded red, and any votes for these BPs are represented by a red line between the whale and the BP. You can see how heavily the red whales vote for the Asian BPs, reflected by the high concentration of red lines coming out of these whales. The purple squares and purple lines represent Mideast and Eastern European BPs. The blue squares and blue lines represent Western BPs. If we compare this to the other seven whales, what we see is that these whales do not vote heavily for any one region. As you can see by the balance of colored lines coming out of these blue whales, these seven vote in a much more geographically diverse way, which is ideal. Bitfinex included. Bitfinex is voting for the, a nicely diversified group of BPs from a geographical perspective. We're only showing the top 21 BPs here, and this might make it look like Bitfinex is voting heavily Asian, but there are many Western BPs that Bitfinex votes for who are not in the top 21, which balances Bitfinex's voting pattern out pretty nicely. Any BPs with a black bar along here are getting a Bitfinex vote. You'll see that Bitfinex votes for many of those BPs that those of us in the Western Hemisphere tend to think of as underappreciated block producers, who contribute much but are currently ranked in the 30s or 40s. Now looking at all of these colored lines from a 30,000 foot view, you'll notice that in the aggregate, there are many more red lines than there are blue lines. A lot more. In fact, there are about five times as many red lines as there are blue lines, with only 18 whale votes directed towards Western BPs and 89 directed towards Eastern BPs. This is because, as we just said, half of our whales vote heavily Asian and the other half vote geographically dispersed. There aren't any whales voting heavily Western to offset the heavily Eastern voting whales. And it's this discrepancy that is causing there to be more support for the Asian region, ultimately resulting in an abundance of Asian flags in our top 21. Now, why is it that seven of our 14 biggest voting whales 
are not taking geographical diversity into account. Is this a cultural issue, a language barrier issue, an incentives issue? Is it greed or short-term thinking? There's no one answer to this question. It's all of the above. But this is why the community's focus is turning towards our BP election mechanics. How can we tweak things without breaking anything? It's not an easy situation because nobody's been in this exact spot before. It's going to take some experimenting. What will be interesting to watch is how conservative versus how dynamic the EOS mainnet will be. Will we only make adjustments that have already been proven out on other chains? Or will the EOS mainnet be the one leading the charge on some innovative election mechanics? And there is the question as to whether we will even be able to pass any needed changes at all. Changes that the Western Hemisphere might believe to be beneficial for the overall longevity of EOS, but that would be detrimental to those who are profiting from the status quo. We'll be following this situation closely and going deeper into this topic in episodes ahead. That's it for this week's episode. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. We'll help you stay current on EOS as this revolution unfolds. Thanks, and we'll see you next week, right here on EOS Weekly.